Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Nanam Paramam Dheyam Knowledge is Supreme we are looking at the second way of getting a second order dynamical system again we will see that it is based on the primary dynamics which is first order system and then on top of that we have an integral controller which is going to make the entire system as well as control this combined controlled system as a second order dynamical system so the example we are going to consider is a search tank under integral control so this is our search tank where we have some feed flow coming in and we will have the outlet flow and we want to control the level edge. Now in terms of feedback, uh, in terms of the actual dynamics of the system, uh, we had already seen uh, that the height dynamics or the level dynamics of the system in deviation form can be written as a dh over dt is equal to f in tilde minus f out tilde so deviation in input flow and the deviation in the outlet flow now when we talk about the feedback control that means uh, we are going to measure the deviation in height and accordingly we are going to change the outlet flow rate so that is the philosophy of a feedback control uh, so the type of feedback control which we are going to look at the integral control uh, at this point I will just give you the form of this uh, in week 5 uh, we will be looking at uh, these type of controllers and that time it will be more clear about uh, where and why this particular form of feedback control is used at this moment let me just write down how this feedback control is going to operate so it is going to give you the value of change in the outlet flow rate uh, based on measurement of height so it is some multiplication of deviation in height and another parameter and then you take the integral of the height change as well. So this is an integral control law and we will be substituting this into uh, the dynamical system so that we will get the final uh, dynamical system between f in and h under feedback control law so what we get is a dh over dt is equal to f in tilde minus kch tilde minus kc over tau i integral 0 to t h tilde dt so this is the final dynamical equation for this combined system plus controller and uh, in order we now are interested in getting a transfer function between this disturbance and the output level in the presence of the controller. So in order to do that uh, we will have to take a Laplace transform of this equation. So what we are going to get is AS HS is equal to F in tilde S minus KC hs minus kc over tau i and the laplace of integral 0 to 3 h tilde dt is the laplace of h divided by s because the laplace of f of t dt is the laplace of function divided by s so we'll try to rearrange this uh, what we get is AS plus KC plus KC over tau IS all this multiplied by HS is going to be F in S. So the Laplace the transfer function is
which we can uh, simplify as and again we can write the transfer function g in the standard form by dividing throughout by kc So this is the final transfer function uh, between the changes in the input disturbance f in and the output and you can see that under this control law we have a quadratic function in terms of s, quadratic polynomial in terms of s. So it is a second order system uh, where this will be your tau square, this will be twice tau zeta. So it is tau square s square plus tau zeta twice tau zeta tau s plus 1. So this is a second order dynamical system and I would like you to pause here for just a moment and try to compare this particular transfer function with the standard transfer function which we had written uh, and then try to see if there is any difference between this transfer function and the general transfer function. So I hope uh, you could figure out the difference. So the standard transfer function was kp over tau square s square plus twice tau zeta s plus 1. So what you could have, the difference which you could have noticed is the numerator was constant when I looked at the standard form but now you can see that there is some function of s which is in the numerator. So this, there is no s here. So that is the difference between a stand, uh, the standard form and this particular transfer function. However, uh, the good point is uh, most of the dynamics depends on the denominator of the transfer function. So this is same. So the dynamics of this particular system are going to follow whatever the dynamics uh, we are going to study as a general second order dynamical system. It's in, but interesting to know that uh, as we have something in the numerator uh, which is also a function of s, what it gives rise to is known as numerator dynamics. Which are dynamics additional to whatever we are going to get based on these denominator dynamics. So this will be covered in later part of this particular week. Uh, where we will be looking at uh, what effect this s in the numerator is going to have but more or less the major dynamics is still governed by the denominator uh, so whatever results we are going to derive are going to be applicable to this system as well and what is the actual significance of this s uh, from a more fundamental point of view in terms of this control system uh, we will see when we talk about this integral control and why we need integral control uh, as it turns out this s is going to play a very key role uh, when we are trying to control this particular system. So this is the second way of getting a second order dynamical system. Uh, again we sta had started with first order system and we had added an integral controller on top of that. And now lastly uh, the third way of getting a second order system and as it turns out it, it does not require a first order dynamical system uh, to get it. These we will call as inherently second order systems inherently second order dynamics. So these are the systems which uh, by themselves are going to give rise to second order dynamics and uh, if we if I want to distinguish them from first order systems, uh, first order system was a system which has a capacity to store mass or energy or it has some inertia associated with it. So first order process it has inertia and when we talk about a second order inherent second order system this inertia is going to be under motion. So those are the type of systems uh, which are going to give rise to inherently second order dynamics. Uh, as it turns out uh, 
these are very uh, uncommon in chemical engineering systems uh, because most of the times our mass storage systems or energy storage systems are stationary uh, they are not moving from one point to the other. So very rarely uh, we would have a system which is inherently second order. Most of the times our systems will be the second order systems which we are going to get are going to be either a series combination of uh, first order systems or a first order system under, uh, in, under an integral control. But then there is a, we still try to cover uh, this third way of getting a second order system because there are still some systems which are going to demonstrate this behavior. Uh, these are quite common in uh, other type of uh, engineering systems like mechanical systems are very many times inherently second order and the reason being uh, most of the times uh, they work with uh, forces and displacement and we can see that uh, force is related to acceleration and acceleration is double derivative of the displacement. So that is the natural way of getting a second order dynamical system. So these type of systems are quite common in other uh, type of engine, other engineering domain. Uh, but in chemistry systems, uh, these would not be that common. So the example we are going to consider is something which you, you might have seen in your chemical engineering laboratory or even in physics laboratory that is a YouTube manometer. So YouTube manometer will be something like this. So under normal conditions, uh, it will be at rest. So we'll call it as a zero position when the pressure on the left hand side, which is P1 and on the right hand side P2, when these two pressures are equal, uh, we'll have a steady height, a constant height in same height in both the limbs. But whenever this P1 is not equal to P2 or let me just show P1 is greater than P2, uh, there will be some change in the level. So one of the limbs will go down and the other liquid in the other limb will go up. So we'll be monitoring. So this is the height which we are going to be measuring. So this particular system, uh, what we are interested in is uh, whenever there is a change in pressure applied across uh, this particular manometer, it is going to change the height from the steady state, uh, from the basic start base point and we want to see how that height changes as a function of time and uh, in five, some minutes uh, I will be in some time I will be able to show you that this particular dynamics is going to be a second order system. So in order to uh, do that, uh, here what we will be writing is a force balance. or in more common term it is Newton's second law of motion. So we will be writing force balance across this particular plane, uh, let me call it as AA dash plane. So what we will be uh, doing is we will be writing the entire force on across this plane and then uh, whatever is the net force, uh, that net force is going to cause acceleration. Uh, into this particular inertia which is the total material of mercury or the manometer fluid which is present inside this system. So let us write this particular force balance. So the net force acting on this particular manometer uh, would be the net downward force on the left hand side which will be P1 times area of the manometer. Which from which we'll subtract the pressure force from the other side, which is P2 times area. Then we also have to overcome uh, the weight of this additional mercury. So what I'm talking about is uh, the weight inside this much portion of the manometer times gravity. So that uh, 
weight uh, would be based on density of the manometer fluid times volume which will be A times 2H times G and then uh, the last force uh, which is going to act on the system is the viscous force. So as you can see uh, when this manometer fluid is going to move in this direction uh, there is going to be a viscous force acting to oppose this particular motion. Uh, so that viscous force will be the fourth force acting on this particular part. Uh, which we can write as delta P frictional pressure drop times area and this net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So it is the mass of the total uh, manometer fluid which is present which is rho times A times L where L is the total length of the manometer fluid. This is the total mass times acceleration which is d2h over dt square. So this is going to be the final uh, force balance uh, which we have and uh, we can now write down how do we get this frictional pressure drop. So for that uh, we will just assume a laminar flow because most of the times uh, this flow will be very slow. Uh, the manometer fluid will not move that fast and it is uh, very uh, common or it is not it is reasonable to assume that this flow is going to be linear laminar and if it is a laminar we can use Hagen Poiseuille's equation to get this delta P uh, which would be 8 mu L flow rate over pi R raised to 4 where Q is the flow rate which I can write as area times velocity and velocity is going to be change in height so dh over dt. So my delta P friction is going to be equal to 8 mu L pi r square dh over dt divided by pi r raised to 4 which on simplification uh, we are going to get is 8 mu l over r square dh over dt. Let us call it equation 1. So we will substitute uh, this particular result in equation 1 to get the final form of the dynamical equation. Which will be P1A minus P2A minus twice rho GHA minus 8 mu L over R square dh over dt a is equal to rho l a dth over dt square and we can see that a is common to all the terms we can also write p1 minus p2 as delta p so we can write this as rho l d2h over dt square plus 8 mu L over R square dh over dt plus twice rho gh is equal to delta p. So this is the dynamical equation uh, which is going to dictate uh, how the height in the manometer is going to change when you apply some differential pressure drop differential pressure across this manometer as a function of time. So before going into the Laplace transform uh, we also have to write this down in a transfer uh, in a deviation form. So at steady state 
what we have is uh, delta p steady state is uh, going to be equal to twice rho g h s steady state. So, we can write down 2 minus 3 to get the final deviation form uh, which is going to be d 2 h over d t square in deviation plus 8 mu l over r square. And in order to write it in the standard form, uh, what we need is coefficient of this term has to be 1. So, we will be throughout dividing by 1 over 2 rho g. So, that gives us the final form as L over 2 g. d 2 h over d t square plus 4 mu l over rho g r square d h over d t plus h tilde equal to 1 over 2 rho g delta p. So, you can see that uh, this particular manometer uh, is going to show a second order dynamical response uh, where when the L over 2 g is going to be equal to tau square, this particular term is going to be equal to twice zeta tau and this is equal to the gain k p. And if you go through the derivation, uh, we never encountered any first order dynamical system here. This uh, particular dynamics is cannot be decomposed into two first order capacities in series or a first order capacity with the control. So, this is a by default it is a second order dynamical system. So, whenever you make a change in delta p, uh, it is going to make a change in h which is going to look like a second order dynamical system. So, these are the three ways in which you can get a second order dynamical response in a chemical engineering system. Thank you.